What is up, everybody? Now we're going to be taking a look at skin disorders, okay? Some of these are a little bit more graphic, but I just pulled them, you know, from internet searches and things like that, so it's not too bad. But some of the more common to skin disorders, I think it's important to be able to recognize what's going on, not only for yourself, because it's almost impossible to get into a dermatologist, but also when you see other people, you can understand what they're, what's going on with them and be a little bit more accepting of, of just kind of what we're seeing. Okay, so one of the common ones, obviously this is going to be a little bit more extreme, um, is acne. Now, we always associate that with somebody being unclean and so on, but it's actually the oil builds up and then it gets uh, a bacterial infection. So UV light and radiation will help to actually toughen up the skin a little bit. Certainly there's different cortisone creams and, and um, even some steroids that you actually put on there to strengthen um, the immune system and so on. So it's just infected uh, oil glands there, not linked to actual um, uh, kind of cleanliness or anything like that, sometimes it's even the foods you eat can be a, a trigger. And it's always going to be different for the different person, depending on uh, what it is. That makes sense because your skin is an excretory organ as well. Salts and other uh, lipids and things like that um, are excreted through the skin so that can be built up. Now, a boil is actually similar to that in one respect. It's way deeper down. It's not associated with an oil gland, but it is an infection of some kind. And so we got to be really careful with a boil. It might look like a pimple here. Um, it's not an, uh, an ingrown own hair or anything like that it's an actual boil it's an infection but it's really deep down in the um in in the dermis itself so it's more likely to burst to the inside spreading that bacteria and that infection um even deeper down so you got to be careful with boils usually you treat it with heat um you might have to have it professionally lanced um to to actually get there in in a sterile environment um to to release some of that and get some treatment now we see some other ones called a, like a bacterial intertrigo okay this is going to be found in areas of skin folds and so on on. So this is going to be, uh, in the name itself tells you it's bacterial, so you got to make sure you don't treat it like athlete's foot. That's a fungus. you got to do some kind of antibiotic cream, and, and what you're seeing is the, the moisture is building up in somewhere that's warm, uh, it's dark, and it's moist. Okay, So those are the three uh, things that actually are great for uh, fostering bacteria, and so you get that rash and everything that goes with it. you got to have some kind of antibacterial. We have ringworm, which is actually a little bit more common. Most people have heard of ringworm, um, but it's actually, be careful, this one is not a worm at all. It's not a parasite. It forms those circles because that's how a fungus will spread. That's how a fungus actually spreads out. Um, it might be in the little in, uh, center of everything, and it sends out these little tendrils um, because it's a saprophyte. It actually feeds off of things outside of its body. And so we find even in the forest of fairy rings with uh, mushroom rings and everything else, and we see that. But a ringworm is a fungal uh, infection, highly contagious. Again, what a fungus, just like a bacteria, would like is warm and moist and dark. Um, you get that combination in there, it's super easy to spread. So even anti uh, iodine paint uh, tinctures and everything that you paint on there um, to help control that fungus. Okay, and then we get shingles. And we talked about shingles um, in the nervous system as well. This shingles is the chickenpox virus that is a special kind of virus that actually will retreat back into the cerebrospinal fluid. So your immune system can't get to it. Okay, it treats it when it's out here, but then when it retreats into that, uh, into that, past that meninges uh, layer that your antibodies can't get there. So if you've had the chickenpox virus vaccine, you should not get sick from the chickenpox if your dosage is right and your immune system responded right. That also means that you're going to be uh, immune from the shingles as well because your antibodies have built up. But what shingles is, is that that uh, that virus that comes out, so there's nothing you can do about it um, for like antibiotics or anything. They don't work on viruses. But what you get are these irritations and rashes, and it's extremely painful and sensitive as well. I've heard patients spend over a month trying to recover from a shingles outbreak. Um, now, warts is actually another virus, okay? It's a virus that's down in the, um, usually it's a little bit deeper, but it is associated with the epidermis um, down in that stratum basal layer that we talked about in the first uh, first unit here. The stratum basal layer, because it makes brand new cells. So it, uh, viruses will hijack the DNA and the cell cycle and just crank out new cells, okay? So it's a virus and we don't have anything in medicine for dealing with viruses. So they resort to kind of caveman medicine. I refer to it as where you have to freeze it and then just cut it out and that kind of thing. Maybe you have a laser. Maybe you paint on some different um, types of chemicals from the blister bark beetle and you put on this thing that, that kind of is almost like an acid that kind of burns that skin away um, and so on. So that's how about the only thing we can do to treat a virus. We have a what we refer 
refer to as lifeguards rash, tinea versicolor. Tinea versicolor is kind of these areas that the, the melanin just doesn't function, okay? It's kind of the areas that refuse to tan, if you will. That's referred to as tinea versicolor. It is a fungus. Um, in theory, you should be able to kind of get some kind of antifungal cream, and that will actually get there. It kind of looks unsightly, but there are no other symptoms. It's not itchy or doesn't, you know, have any other effects um, with that. Now, the opposite of that, in my mind, is when you have dark skin that loses its coloring. Here with Tinea Versicolor, we had light skin that wouldn't darken up. Well, here we have dark skin that all of a sudden loses its pigmentation. We refer to that as vitiligo. Okay, you hear maybe pronounced vitiligo or whatever, but I've always heard of vitiligo. Vitiligo is when um, darker skin, this is a genetic thing, and the genetics just aren't right. And so all of a sudden, it loses its pigmentation. Okay, so these are areas that lose their defenses. Certainly, again, it's one of those that's more unsightly than anything else. There's no other, you know, bad issues with it. It can spread. It's not passed through the lineage or anything like that. It's just an area that loses its pigmentation. Okay, we have psoriasis. This is overly dry skin. And so the skin will actually, remember, it has to have this uh, good balance between for an acid mantle and, and making um, an oil uh, layer on there to, to protect it and keep it hydrated. And so if it gets really, really dry, it'll start to make these white patchy uh, areas. It can be um, become cracked and become infected that way. But psoriasis is over dry skin so you have to hydrate it somehow and so people down in south don't get as much psoriasis as people up in the northern hemispheres okay leprosy is a bacterial information uh infection um it's infected uh or transmitted through bacteria in groundwater and so you you hear about things even in biblical uh times we have the the leper colonies and everything else it was simply just a bacterial infection in the water so if they could have put the antibiotics and so on we'd uh avoid some of the the other uh, characteristics of leprosy. So antibiotics is how it is, but what it does is it affects the soft tissues and the circulation there, and so it results in um, some unsightly things. Now, ex eczema or eczema, um, eczema is more, uh, you find it more common in people that have allergies, okay? So it's an allergic reaction. Again, it's more dry, but usually it's some kind of kind of allergy-based, and so the Langerhorn cells of the uh, layers and, and stratum spinosum tend to kick in and, and cause a histamine response. Um, we could also get dermatitis, which is similar to that, but dermatitis is usually contact dermatitis. So it's, you're touching something that your skin is allergic to versus eczema is more just something out in the environment. Okay. So um, cortisone creams and things like that toughen up the skin a little bit, watch your hydration, and also um, maybe some antihistamines and so on. Something that you might take for allergies might calm that down. Okay, um, I'm going to I'm going to skip a bunch of the uncommon ones because they're just ones that, um, we find in there. But one of the other disorders we really do need to talk about is cancer. Skin cancer itself is the number one form of cancer that we find. And we're finding it in more and more people um, at younger and younger ages because we find are that people uh, don't take care of their skin. Um, I'm guilty of it myself. I don't wear enough uh, sunscreen when I go outside. And even though we've kind of found that when you do wear sunscreen, that poses a problem because then you feel protected. Your skin is not burning and all those. You feel like you're protected against UV radiation, but you're not. Skin uh, Sunscreen doesn't uh, actually protect you from all forms of UV radiation, so you're more prone actually to some forms of skin cancer if you wear a lot of sunscreen because you stay outside longer unprotected. Um, other than the, the cream... Um, and lotions, it just doesn't filter everything. But we gotta understand some things about what is cancer, okay? Cancer is an uncontrolled cell cycle. And so when we when we have the uncontrolled cell cycle, um, really what's happening is the, the, uh, the, the, it's, it's the DNA itself has been mutated to a point where it's just making more and more copies uncontrolled of just garbage. And, and so the, the, the cells, the tissues themselves aren't functioning the way they were supposed to be. And so we find that is cancer in its sense is just hijacked cells that are just cranking out more bad copies. And so it loses, loses all cohesiveness and functionality. So we actually have something built into our genome. This is called the P53 gene. It's found on chromosome 17. And it, like I said, it's the P53 gene. We know exactly where to look for it. And the P53 gene actually reads the DNA in multiple steps of the cell cycle. Okay, the cell cycle, you have a G1 phase, a growth phase. We have an S phase, and that's when it makes a copy of the DNA getting ready to divide into two cells. Then it has another phase of G2 phase, another growth phase, and then it goes through mitosis. Well, the P53 gene comes in at each of those 
gaps between the or stops between the G1 and the S phase. And then again, after the S phase and the G2 phase, before the cell is allowed to um, make a copy of itself, the P53 gene does a quality check on the DNA. Is it good enough to be able to pass on and, and actually make a copy of? Okay, so the growth phase, we see that it stops and reads it and says, yep, this DNA is quality enough to make a copy of. And then it stops again right after that S phase and reads both of those strands and says, is this good enough to split off into two cells? So that's the P53 gene. If that P53 gene is mutated, then you're more prone to get cancer because you lost your quality check. Now, I want to be careful and very clear. I didn't say you get cancer because of the P53 gene, and that's not what it means at all. All. It just means you lost your quality check if you have a bad P53 gene. So you're more prone to um, that. You don't have the safety catches. Also, you can have a healthy P53 gene and still get cancer. So it's, it's just a quality check. Sometimes the, the cell cycle gets sped up so much with the cancer um, that it just skips all stops altogether and just goes. And, and so you have some problems with that. Now, skin cancer itself can be identified, and it's important that you understand this because getting into a dermatologist is quite tough. And so a lot of people take a look at something, they just add ah, it's nothing, or they look at it and they worry about it and they can't tell um, some things. So here's some things. They call them the ABCs, ABCDEs. There's lots of different things out there. Nature loves symmetry. So if you pick out a little freckle, pick out a little mole on your skin, you look at it. Is that thing symmetrical? Okay, it can have different shapes and that's fine, but is it symmetrical? If it's asymmetrical, that could be cancer. Look at the border of it. Is that an irregular or ragged border? Okay, nature loves to have things kind of symmetrical for one, but also smooth and regular. Okay, it doesn't like things that are irregular. And the same thing with color. Look at the color of that thing. Now, to be clear, moles will change color. Okay, that's normal. But is it one of those things where it's kind of red with some black freckles in it? Or is it the other way around where it's black freckles with some white little spots in there? Look for uniformity in color more than anything and do know that it might change color. It will change color. That's just the way that works. Look for something non-uniform as a warning sign. Now, I hate this D, okay? This is, D is one of those things. I know it's uh, always put on by the uh, Cancer Society and everything else. I hate D, actually, because they say between three and six millimeters. Um, they've seen our melanomas, our skin cancers. But typically, they say if it's bigger, well, then it's, you know, a big warning sign. Well, that's a full sense of security. Somebody looks at it and it's like a little tiny thing. If you catch it when it's really small, that's awesome because then it's easier to treat. But people tend to downplay and say, oh, it's not big enough. It's not going to be that big a deal. So I really don't like using personally um, the diameter in there. Um, you can look at things like the ease for elevation. Um, there's some other things that you can find. But there's three different types of skin cancer I'd like to talk about. All of these are cancer, by the way. One of them is basal cell carcinoma. Basal cell carcinoma means that the, the cells of the stratum basal, so it's in the epidermis, is infected um, with the cancer, okay? And so what you have to do to treat that is you have to go underneath the epidermis. So you have to cut away into the dermis, and the, I guess if anything, it is skin cancer. So that means all the surrounding tissue is prone to cancer too, because if it's lost its immunity here, every, that everything that's been equally exposed is as likely, okay? So that's important. But for treatments, we know that it hasn't metastasized. It isn't um, the capability to spread yet. Okay, so catching it soon, um, you see that it's actually dimpled in in the middle. Um, it's kind of ragged on the edges and everything else. Those are all classic signs of a skin cancer. This is basal cell carcinoma. It goes down into the uh, epidermis, and so you have to cut below that to the dermis. It means you're going to have a scar. Um, you're going to have those things. But it also explains why. I don't know if you caught it up here. This guy's got it here too. But these are the types of things that would actually tend to you know, here we see some colorations there. And I have one more that I wanted to show you that was kind of on the side of the nose. And this is classic because it'll form a little scab and then go away, clear up, and then form a scab and then clear up. That's because it's in the epidermis. And so it heals and does um, that type of uh, that type of cycling. Okay. Don't underplay it. Don't dismiss it. So don't say, ah, I got better. And then, ah, I came back. I wonder what's going on. Th those are all classic symptoms. Now, Sometimes it progresses into squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma means that it's down in the dermis itself. Okay, so you're going to have to cut below that into the, uh, the hypodermis layers, and hopefully you got all of it. Okay, this is also a, a type of cancer that 
can metastasize. What that means is it forms little extensions, almost like little seed packets of, of cancer cells that would break off and go into the bloodstream. Those would pick up and go into um, other regions of the body and take over, kind of stick in that area and grow and divide, grow and divide and take over that area too. That's squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, so you're going to have to cut down past the dermis and also screen to see if it's metastasized. If it has, you're talking chemotherapy um, because it's it's it has the capability to spread. So you got to catch those things um, a little bit sooner. It's easier to catch because it's down in the dermis and so you see the tissue has been eaten away. Now, the last one is referred to as malignant melanoma. Okay, it sounds worse, but all three, remember, are actual cancer. So malignant means that it has metastasized. We already know that. And so we find that actually all the skin layers have been there, including the underlying um, tissues. So this guy probably lost most of his skull, okay, out in this area, because we know it's down into that area too. Okay, we find that malignant melanoma might be in the soft tissue. So this guy probably lost um, his ear and possibly even part of his jaw um, because it's it's down that deep. It's through all the layers of the skin, but we see malignant melanoma. It's the most rare of them all, um, but it is one of those things um, that it, it has affected all the layers of the skin. So you got to remove it as well as all the connective. We're talking also almost guaranteed we're talking um, chemotherapy because it has metastasized, okay? So there's different layer uh, levels of progressions with this. I don't want to leave you with the impression that um, skin itself, uh, if you leave it, leave it long enough, it'll then go into squamous cell. And then if you leave it even longer, it goes into malignant melanoma. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes it immediately starts as malignant melanoma right from the beginning. So it's important to see the signs and symptoms right away um, before we get into anything else. Okay. Now I have some slides at the end about burn classifications. It's kind of the same concept. First degree burn, that's the old classifications, of course. First degree burns is just up down into the epidermis. Okay. Second degree is the dermis itself. And then third degree is getting down into the connective tissue. So it kind of follows the same of the progressions. But I'm going to stop it here because I was looking for um, skin cancer, being able to talk about those, the P53 gene and other uh, kind of skin disorders of the more common nature and talk about in terms of cause, symptoms, and treatments. Okay, that's going to sum up everything for this chapter. You guys have a good one.